Howdy, teachers. Super good to see all of you. Um, we sure hope that what we have to share with you this week um, really just helps helps your students focus on the Savior and, and helps them better prepare for their learning experience. So my name is Jeff Miller, and uh, as you guys will recognize, Melanie is here with me. Melanie, anything that you want to... Well, we'll have Melanie introduce herself in a second, and then we... <laughs> uh, um, and then we have Kirsten here from Colorado Springs. So Kirsten, thank you so much for being here. Um, we're going to do two or three things before we jump in and, and give Kirsten the the screen or the floor or whatever you want to call it. So Melanie, um, we're excited for some news from you. And so we'll just let you start first. Yeah. So one thing that we learn working in the Lord's kingdom is that he moves us where he needs us or where we need to grow. And he's moving me. And so I am excited for new opportunities, not exactly sure what will be happening, but one of the things that I won't be doing is this, um, this podcast. And so I'm, wow, such mixed feelings. I have loved it and I've learned so much being here. Next week in my spot will be my dear friend, Stephanie Sherman, who brings years of seminary teaching experience and a fantastic perspective, lots of insight. So I'm really excited, teachers, that you get to learn from Stephanie and um, I'll be sitting in the audience with you and learning from her also. So that's my news. Melanie, thanks. We <laughs> teachers, we and your and, and the teachers, and we just love you and are grateful for the time we get to spend with you. So, so thanks. Um, I want to do a brief introduction, and then Kirsten, here we go. So, uh, you'll notice um, that right up here, there's a really cool phrase: "Invite diligent learning." This is one of the principles of teaching in the Savior's way, and so. Um, the Savior invited others to prepare for their learning experience. And, and you can look at this section a little bit closer if you'd like. As you scroll down to the very bottom of this section, invite diligent learning, here's some other ways that you can invite students to come prepared. So give learners opportunities to teach a portion of the lesson. Today, I want you to focus, uh, we'll focus a little bit on encouraging learners to like review a video, scripture, a message before you meet. Come prepared um, with an, and, and so Kirsten's um, practicing this, and I think she's very good at it and gave Melanie and I an opportunity to do this. So um, be thinking about ways that you can invite diligent learning even before uh, seminary starts the learner experience. So that's one of the things we want to kind of look at today. So without further ado, uh, Kirsten, why don't you just tell us where you want to start? All right. Well, this week we are looking at Matthew 8, Mark 2 through 4, and Luke 7. And a lot of miracles occur this week. So I'm, for me, in my seminary class, I am titling this the Miracle Week, right? We are going to, going to focus on the miracles, the healings, what that looks like for our students, what that looks like for us, and how that can also be a miracle in our classroom. And one of the greatest miracles we can provide our students is helping them prepare and not all of them are going to be able to, but with that idea in mind is I have already invited Jeff and Melanie to prepare. So with that, we are going to, I'm going to share my screen here. So starting with this definition, um, what is a miracle? What do you feel a miracle is, Jeff and Melanie? Um, so our family's, our family's funny. My family is a little bit funny. My oldest daughter's about seven years older then my next four children and my youngest child will be about seven years younger than, than the group. So we've got like three little families kind of spread out. Um, we weren't able to have children for, for about those seven years. Um, my second child is, is our son. Um, and we named him, uh, his middle name is Samuel after Samuel in the, in the old Testament. Um, because we, we just, we prayed and we fasted and we did everything we could like Hannah did. Um, so that the Lord would would give us that blessing. He didn't have to, but he did. And we feel like part of that blessing was um, the prayers and the fasting. And so that that faith, that idea of faith necessary um, for miracles to be manifest, we felt like that was a miracle for us. And we're grateful for it every day. Sometimes he's challenging, but it's okay. <laughs> I understand because I have one of those miracles myself that is also challenging, but a great blessing. May I ask you a follow-up question, Jeff? Yeah, um, and before you do, teachers, when when you ask a question, listen long enough and carefully enough to ask a follow-up follow question, and it will, it will always lead to a, a deeper experience. So good job. Okay, go. <laughs> how, having that blessing answered, that miracle answered, how did that help you see the Lord more involved in your life? I'm I'm grateful that, that I could see his hand in, in our lives in that way. Um, it was something that we had sought for 
for a really long time. And it was, it was, it came at a point in our lives where we were content if the Lord didn't bless us that way, but we still continue to seek it. Um, and so I've just, I feel a sense of gratitude. I feel a sense of, of, um, love because of that experience for my heavenly father and for the savior. I love that. Melanie, may I ask you a question going off of what Jeff just said? Have yes. you ever had an experience where a miracle was answered maybe in a different way? Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I love it when the answer is what we want, but sometimes the miracle is not what we want. And um, I can I share my experience if I'm brief? Sure. So um, um, I received the news that the Lord was using me in a different way, that I had a different direction to go and that I wouldn't be teaching seminary. And I was really struggling. It was not what I wanted at all. And I think I argued with the Lord some. And um, I happened to be in the temple, not I, I wish I could say that I had gone seeking inspiration, but I didn't. I was just enjoying being in the temple. And while there, unbidden, came a really clear confirmation that this was really what he wanted for me. And that that if I could be accepting of this, that it could be a good thing. And And as I have adjusted my perspective to what might be his path, um, not the miracle I wanted, what I wanted was a way to keep teaching seminary, then um, my my heart has changed. And it feels like a miracle to me um, because I'm not bitter or sad. I'm excited, even though I don't know what the door is that will open. Does, does that make sense? It, it feels miraculous. It absolutely makes sense. And it teaches us one of these things. I have these questions here for you to look at. One of these things is miracles look different, Right. Sometimes they are very big miracles and sometimes they are small miracles. Now, if you were my seminary students, I would pull open the um, woman of Nain video that is suggested in the curriculum for this week. And I would ask them to look at um, what this miracle looked like from different perspectives. So imagine you are the mom that you have, you're a widow, you have lost your only son, your only family member left. And here you are marching in the street, parading your final son, this last hard thing like you're experiencing, right, Melanie? A little bit of a death, perhaps a stop and end to something. But there are other people in the audience as well. There are other people who are there as well. There's the person who has passed away. There's her son. There are the passerbys, the people who are witnessing, the people who are there for this funeral procession. And I would play this video and I would ask my students, what what is it like to experience miracle from all these different perspectives? And from each of these perspectives, what do you learn about Jesus Christ? So since we're not going to watch the video, I do want you, though, to turn with me, please, to uh, Luke chapter 7. This particular miracle um, starts in verse 11 and goes through 17. But we're going to focus on verse 13. And um, I actually really love the question um, from the manual. And it simply states, um, what about this miracle teaches you? What, what do you learn about Jesus Christ from this miracle? And try to focus more on what he's just doing as to what his intent is, what it teaches us about his character. And like you testified of Melanie, that he loves all of us, right? What does this, what does this miracle teach you about the savior so let's go there please verse 13 jeff do you have that would you mind reading that for us i do yeah verse 13 yes <clears throat> and when the lord saw her he had compassion on her and said unto her weep not so melanie that kind of reminds me of what you were talking about going to the temple right mm -hmm. how did you feel the lord answering you saying weep not wow i hadn't made that connection at all that's exactly the way that it felt was was weep not hmm. so what does that teach us about the character of christ i think it's in that verse it talks about his deep compassion that he understands our our losses he understood her loss my loss jeff's loss the absence of another child i love and, that and he's willing to perform miracles to help us with our losses. 
if if I had a board right now, I would write that phrase on the board mm-hmm. because that is something we each deeply, profoundly feel is some loss of something. And, and Lord, it would be, it would be a, an, another place that I would probably go with my students. They may struggle. I have young students. They may struggle with the miracle question, but I know they have felt losses and they have felt times when they have wept and he has filled them, but they maybe didn't see it as a miracle. It might be another way for us to help for that. I could help them see it as such. I love that. That is awesome. For me, I would also perhaps now transition into something like, well, what do modern day miracles look like? Because I don't expect that many of us will be parading through a street with our sons and that Christ will come up and heal us. What do modern miracles look like for our teenagers today in 2023? What does a modern miracle look like? Going to school every day and holding on to your testimony. Absolutely. I, I, uh, I'm thinking of, um, of their families and families staying together um, and lo- being kind and loving. <laughs> I think those are miracles based on um, what's happening in the world around us and what's happening to families. So um, President Nelson, for the last several conferences, has spoken a lot about miracles. This is something you could do with your students. You could have them if they have a device. They could simply go in and do in the search terms, search miracle, and just focus on President Nelson. And you can do that by topic. You can do that by speaker. So for me, I went in the search terms. I typed in miracle, and I just focused on President Nelson. And I was able to pull up a list. But this is a question I would want my students to think about is, what do President Nelson's words teach me that I can do better to see and expect miracles in my life? I love the miracles that you both have already shared that you could see and expect, but I think that there are miracles every day. And president Nelson has also taught us the same thing. So there are, um, there's this, if you are interested, I created this word document that has all of these, sorry, let me see if I can scoot it over here. These are every time President Nelson has talked about miracles since becoming prophet in 2018. Um, I would like to go to April of 2022. And Jeff, will you read this for us and tell us what does this teach you about what modern day miracles look like and how we can seek for them? Of course. Moroni assured us that God has not ceased to be a God of miracles. Every book of scripture demonstrates how willing the Lord is to intervene in the lives of those who believe in him. He parted the Red Sea for Moses, helped Nephi retrieve the the brass plates, and restored his church through the prophet Joseph Smith. Each of these miracles took time and may not be exactly what those individuals originally requested from the Lord. In the same way, the Lord will bless you with miracles if you believe in him, doubting nothing. Do the spiritual work to seek miracles. Prayerfully ask God to help you exercise that kind of faith. I promise that you can experience for yourself that Jesus Christ giveth power to the faint and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Fourth, uh, see, few things will accelerate your spiritual momentum more than realizing that the Lord is helping you to move a mountain in your life. Okay. So now if you have study journals, I would ask what is a mountain? What is a mountain in your life right now that you would love to see a miracle for? And just a quiet time to reflect. I don't want you to share this one. This one is just between you and the Lord. What is a mountain in your life that you would love to have the spiritual momentum to get over? And in my class, they get really fidgety if it's quiet. And so I'd probably have the tabernacle choir seeing more holiness give me or something like that in the background. I love that you said that Melanie, because actually, so I love this song by Shauna Edwards. Um, We have sung it in our primary programs before it is called the miracle. And it talks about the miracles that Jesus Christ performed, but how the greatest miracle he performs for us is, um, the atoning sacrifice he made for each of us, right? And the fact that our greatest miracle is being able to become like Heavenly Father because of the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So this is definitely something you could play as background music, or it is something you could play in conjunction with them thinking about a miracle they would like 
to seek for and following President Nelson's words. So some other ideas with this document of President Nelson's words on miracles is you could either do it individually or as groups. You could have them go through and highlight, pick out things that stand out to them about what miracles look like in today's world and um, how they can be active and proactive in faithfully seeking miracles. President Nelson has a lot of counsel for us on that. So um, the next part I would love to talk about is what have you learned from witnessing the Savior blessing other people you know? So this relates back to the man sick with the palsy. So moving on to the next day's lesson in Mark 2, verses 2 through 12. This story, amazingly, was just spoken about in general conference by Elder McConkie, and he had a great analogy here. So I would, as a teacher, um, eventually bring that up in the lesson. I love actually how this lesson starts in imagining what it would be like to be there, to be present, to be in these different places, and to talk about one of the lesson preps that I had asked you to think about was, what have you learned from witnessing the Savior blessing other people you know. So I'm going to ask you that question. If you haven't had time to prepare, that is absolutely okay. Please, Jeff. Yeah. Um, I teach a, an online institute class, and it's been really interesting for the for the people to share some of the things that they're learning about the Savior. But one of the things that I've learned about him is that um, when, he, when he does things, it doesn't just bless one person. There's always other people um, that are part of him. Sometimes it's people reaching out and following a prompting. Sometimes it's people that that get to witness what happens in the lives of other people. But um, he's so good and never just blessing one person when he when he acts in in our lives. I can testify of that as well. So Jeff, I can tell that you have something specific in mind. Maybe maybe it's too personal to share. But what kind of healing did that offer, um, did the Savior offer you by watching this other miracle happen for someone else? Oh, uh, seeing what the Lord's doing in other, in other people's lives uh, helps get me out of my own little personal pity party quite frequently, actually. <laughs> when, I th when I think life is hard or rough, um, he gives me experiences with others and, uh, and it helps me appreciate where I'm at. I love that. So can we go there? Let's go there to the, the set of scriptures. Go to Mark 2, please. And actually, we're going to start in verse 4. And I want you to look here. Let's look for what it is that these people who are witnessing, because there are all kinds of people here, right? Um, what is it that they are witnessing? What are they doing to help this young man receive his miracle, his blessing? And Let's go in verse, and maybe perhaps what unusual answer did they receive first? So let's start in verse four and read verses four and five, please. Melanie, do you have that? I do. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. So is this the kind of miracle that the people were seeking for immediately? What do you think? I think it, I think it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever had a time in your life when you've experienced or witnessed somebody going through something and, and maybe the first miracle you don't recognize as a miracle right away? I think often that's the case, isn't it? The, yeah, yeah. So Kirsten, I'm also thinking a lot of times in the New Testament, people would say, you know, this person has this problem because either them or their parents or their grandparents sinned. Um, so indirectly, this might've been really helpful for this individual too, just to know, look, you're clear, we're good. <laughs> Maybe that was helpful too. So right. probably not exactly what he wanted, but. I'm sure it was lift, uh, uplifting and helpful. Absolutely. And actually, if we go to um, the talk that Elder McConkie gave, 
So this talk from Elder McConkie, and they sought to see Jesus who he was. A great thing to do, depending on your students. Your students, maybe they're the kind that need some interaction. Maybe they're the kind that, that you could take this talk and you could break it down. Or if you have a lot of students who are still in paper scriptures, I do have several of those. So I actually will take the meaningful parts of the talk and um, put them onto a Word document, print that out, and have them go through an underline. If you have students that need some reflection time and they are mature enough for that, this would be a great time to pause, um, pass out this talk if you're doing that, have them pull it up on their devices, and go through and underline what are the parts that are modern and relatable to us. How does this, how does the Lord answer miracles on somebody else in a way that blesses us? So one of those points is here. I love how Elder McConkie describes the situation right here. One of the other things I love to do when I am reading these scriptures is to put myself in the situation. So how can I relate this to me in the moment? How do I make this modern and relevant for me, like Nephi suggested we do, right? Um, so let's read this quote. Melanie, can you see where it starts here with now the story as I have come to understand it? Mm -hmm. Now the story as I have come to understand it. Early in his ministry, Jesus returned to Capernaum, a small fishing village located on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. He had recently performed a series of miracles by healing the sick and casting out evil spirits. Anxious to hear and experience the man called Jesus, the villagers gathered at the home where he was rumored to be staying. As they did, Jesus began to teach. Do you want me to keep going? Uh, if you would, actually, we're going to skip down here. Um to the story focuses on a man please read this one the, yes the story focuses on a man sick of the palsy and his four friends palsy is a form of paralysis often accompanied by weakness and tremors i imagine one of the four saying to the others jesus is in our village we all know about the miracles he has performed and those he has healed if we can just get our friend to jesus perhaps he too can be made whole and here's where i would ask is there a time in your life where you have had a friend, someone you love, that you would love to invite to Jesus to be made whole? And what mm. are you willing to do to help them get there? That's I really, love that question. Well, and that, that um, for me, knowing what, what comes in the rest of the talk, that's a really easy look for. You're now one of the friends, and you're thinking about a friend that you want to bring closer to the Savior. So read the rest of the talk looking for what the friends did that maybe okay. you could do as you're carrying and helping your friend come closer to the savior, or maybe it's a mom or a dad or a brother or a sister, but that's Absolutely. pretty relevant. <laughs> pretty relevant. And yeah. it's just, it just happened, right? These are things that the, that the apostles and prophets are teaching us and asking us to look for and do now. So that is where I would probably take my lesson, depending on my class and seeing how do you do this? What does it look like putting yourself in those positions of those four friends? So um, are you okay if we move on to another lesson? Is that all right? Yeah. Okay. So the next one I want you to, to look at is um, actually we're going to skip here to Mark chapter four, verses 35 through 40, uh, 41. And um, the invite that I asked you guys to do in preparation was actually from the Come Follow Me this week. A lot of teachers, a lot of you will notice that throughout this week's curriculum, there have been a lot of invitations focused on Come Follow Me and also a lot of invitations focused on including their families. So in asking their families what they have experienced, how they would answer these questions. So helping us become more of a home-centered church supported gospel. And I loved these questions from Mark 4, 35 through 41. The direction was write down the four questions that you see here in Mark, and then ask yourself, what is it about these? Where do I sit with these questions? So I would like you to take a minute to do that. If I've already put the questions here for you, if you already have them underlined in your scriptures, that is fantastic. This is where I would invite you to add notes to your, if you have a device or if you're using paper scriptures, pencil in your responses. How does this apply to me? How would I answer this question today? So I'm going to give you a minute to look at that and see. Let's start with verse 38. If you will take a minute and look at that and make a note either on your phone or write it in your paper scriptures, Master, carest thou not that we perish. So after my students take a minute to answer these questions, 
Um, I would probably also continue to draw the picture for them, right? And say, you can imagine being at sea. You can imagine the tumult of waves and the Savior is there peacefully asleep. And ask, where else in your life have you experienced or in the scriptures, when have you witnessed someone else experiencing a similar situation and the Lord reassuring them? And for me, and I know for several of my students, because they've brought this up before, um, Doctrine and Covenants 121 is a great linking scripture here. So Doctrine and Covenants 121 verses 7 through um, seven through 10. Let's do that. And I think we'll actually end there and talk about how this is. The Lord always answers us with peace. That is, he is the Prince of Peace, the messenger of peace. And that is what he does. So even though the boat was rocky, even though the storm was great, even though they feared, he still came back. Notice the first thing that the Savior does when you look at Mark 4, 35 through 41. And the same thing he does with Joseph Smith is not rebuke right away. The first thing he does is provide calm and peace. He stills the waters first, and then he teaches. So Doctrine and Covenants 121, and that's where I will end and turn time back over here. Uh, verse 7, my son, peace be unto thy soul. Thine adversity and thine afflictions shall be but a small moment. And I can testify that the Savior really does bring us peace and that our afflictions truly are a small moment. And in our afflictions, he provides miracles. This to me is another sample of a great miracle that the Lord performed. But of course he did because he's the creator of it and he is the master of the earth and skies. A great way to bring in a hymn would be able to play some of those hymns that talk about these things and um, end on those notes or give your students time to just reflect and play some of this inspiring music in the background, depending on what your students need. But I can testify that the Savior will bring peace to their souls and to yours as you teach, because he does it for each of us. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Kirsten, thank you so much. Um, we're so grateful for your time and your and your effort here and grateful for the resources that you're, you're sharing with us. We want to end, um, but give Melanie just a couple minutes to share a couple things she's learned from the curriculum this week and uh, this idea of inviting diligent learning. So Melanie, Thanks. you're up. Okay. Um, so teachers, I love this because Kirsten has used so much of the preparation. And as I was preparing for today, I came up with some ideas and I, I actually canvassed some teachers that I respect. I said, how are you doing this teacher preparation? And so I took some notes, sorry, student preparation. How, what is working that's successful? And, um, and, and uh, here's just the ideas. I jotted them down. You can take a screenshot if they're useful to you. And I'd also invite you, if you have other suggestions, feel free to put them in the comments. Teachers will read them and we can kind of share that there. Um, you can remind them the day before at the end of class. Um, you could use a group text group as long as you have another adult in your texting group. I include my seminary supervisor in our texting group so that I can send out a group text. Um, I can send it home in an email, either to students or parents. Students don't read emails, so I have much better luck with their <laughs> parents. But there are a number of these um, preparation invitations that are things that they can do with their families. And so those in particular, I would send home as an email. Have it on the board while they're coming in. Even if it's a family thing, say, you know, they can quickly text their mom and ask that question. Give them five minutes. It will still be rich and bless them. And then a shared document. Um, some teachers have started to do that where they, there's just always a, a OneDrive document or a Google document where the preparation assignments are posted and students know that's where they go. Most of all, even if a few students come prepared, it will bless their lives and it will begin to lift everyone else. So um, teachers, don't give up on the student preparation. Um, Kirsten, you have <laughs> used this abundantly and how it can bless our class. And so hopefully these are some mechanics that might help you through it. Okay. Um, let's let's uh, go ahead and end right here. Just one, one quick thought. One of the things that, that um, we get from this practice is just a deeper experience with our students. So we would commend that to you and, and we're grateful to be here. So thank you for watching. Bye. Bye.